Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, <coughs> today I am going to discuss about pharmacology of beta blockers. Now when you discuss about ANS, autonomic nervous system, we in body in it maintain a balance. One is sympathetic system, another is parasympathetic system. Now if you look at sympathetic system, we have two receptors, alpha receptors and beta receptors. So, if you develop a compound, the compound we have like compound stimulate alpha receptors or compound stimulate beta receptor. Similarly, we can have the pharmacological action when you block the alpha and beta receptor. So, today what I am going to discuss about pharmacology of beta receptors. Now, before I discuss, you can think that these whole compound it inhibit adrenergic response mediated to beta receptors. Like you can say example of beta 1 receptors, beta 2 receptors, beta 3 receptors, beta 4 and beta 5. But mostly we will be discussing about beta 1 and beta 2 receptors. Because beta 3 is an adipose tissue but rest of the receptors it localizes in CNS. Now <coughs> there are competitive antagonist of beta adrenergic receptors because some are beta receptors have a antagonistic action on selective or some are non-selective. That means some compound it block only beta 1 receptor that is selective one or beta 2. Some has a dual action like labertalol it has a beta 1 and beta 2 receptor. So, all these properties like how the affinity and efficacy and safety take place it depends on relative affinity of beta 1 and beta 2 receptor. Now, it is also depend on how this drug has an intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. At the same time, those who are also blocking alpha receptors and if it is lipid soluble, then there will be more CNS penetration. So, you can have a side effect of CNS also and also if a particular <laughs> beta blocker have a vasodilatory properties. So, we can have a comparative evaluation when you look at both non-selective and selective beta blocker along with pharmacokinetic properties. Now, individually if you see beta blockers, beta 1 receptor blockers like where it is localized beta 1 receptors mostly in the heart. So, if you stimulate beta 1 receptor definitely it will increase the rate of heart rate, it will increase the force of contraction it will have more conduction automaticity. So, in a condition like hypertension or chronic heart failures, you can use as a treatment mode for a beta blockers. Similarly, it alter the renin release in the kidney and when you stimulate beta T receptors, it enhance the lipolysis in adipose tissue. Now, <coughs> look at beta 2 receptors, it mostly localized in smooth muscle. So, if you stimulate it will have a relaxation and also like condition like eye, like glaucoma it can be used or that is for a beta 1 receptors or especially bronchial asthma like it because if you stimulate beta 2 receptors. So, it will have you know bronchoconstriction and action on the bladders, uterus and J smooth muscle. Similarly, beta 2 receptors are mostly in blood vessels and once beta 2 receptor is stimulated it causes glycogenolysis. Now, similarly what I said earlier beta T receptors is mostly localized in adipose tissue. So, if you stimulate beta T receptors you can have lipolysis. So, it can be used in the treatment of obesity some of the drug have been already developed. Now, here if you see that very strong history if you look back and see in 1948 dichloro isoproniline was developed pharmacological properties was described during 1948. 
And later on, based on that, in 1960, there is synthesis of proethanolol. And based on that, propanolol was synthesized by Sir James Black, and it was a highest selling drug, highest selling hard drug. A propanolol was used during 1965. And later on, selective beta blocker was developed in ethanolol was synthesized. Now, once you classify, as I say, selective, non selective, and the dual action, you can see that you have a beta adrenergic blocker antagonist. The first generation, these are non selective beta blockers. Like you can take an example of propanolol, nodulol, pindolol, timolol, penbutolol. Now, we have a second generation on beta 1 selective blockers, like we have acetabulol, ethanolol, most commonly prescribed drug ethanolol. Bison, bispropolol, then betoxolol, esmolol in hypertensive crisis it is used and metoprolol is also commonly used. Now look at the third generation beta blockers. These are non-selective vasodilators like cartelol, carbidolol. It is most, it is called a vasodilatory beta blockers. It is used in heart failure and busindolol or levetrolol is a dual inhibitor. Similarly, <coughs> Third generation are beta 1 selective vasodilator are celiprelol. So, specially when you look at celiprelol, it has beta 1 blocking properties and agonistic effect on beta 2 receptors. So, it can be suitable for patient having bronchial asthma with hypertension. And another drug is nebupolol. Now, let us discuss about pharmacological action of beta blockers. As I said, <laughs> if you see effect on a heart of the beta blockers, Mostly beta blockers are uh, beta receptors are present is beta 1 receptors. Now, if you block beta 1 receptors, there will be decreased cardiac contractility, myocardium contractility. There will be decreased heart rate because conductivity is decreased. Also, at the same time, there will be decreased cardiac output and cardiac workload, and because it will also help in oxygen consumption, that is why it is been selected in case of heart failure cases. Now, <coughs> when you look at the mechanism, the beta blocker is helping AB conduction delayed from AB node to SN node, like SN node to AB node it is delayed and it also help in refractory period is increases and automaticity is decreases. So, it can be used in several conditions in heart disease. Now, look at the effect on blood vessel. As I said that beta 2 receptors are mostly localized in blood vessels. So, if you block beta 2 receptor, because beta 2 is mediated by vasodilatation. So, it will help the peripheral resistance increase initially, then it will also have cardiac output decrease and with continued treatment with resistant vessels gradually adapt to chronically reduce you know cardiac output and total peripheral resistance is decreased. So, you can improve systolic and BP and diastolic BP fall. So, because of effect on the periphery through the beta 2 receptor, it can be used in therapeutically. Now, what about the other mechanism as an antihypertensive action? Once we have said that directly act on beta 1 receptor, second is in periphery beta 2 receptors, but it can be also act through central mechanism. Like if you give this, that there is a noradrenal in its release from sympathetic terminal and due to block of pre synaptic beta receptor mediated action. So, once noradrenal get decrease the release. So, definitely it will improve in case of a hypertensive patient. Now, another mechanism we discuss is since beta receptors also present in kidney. So, it alter the release of renin and at the same time it has a central you know it inhibiting the activity of central sympathetic flow. So, all together it act as a anti hypertensive along with beta 1 and beta 2 receptor. Now, <coughs> once you use beta blocker because beta blockers are very contraindicated in respiratory tract like bronchial asthma. Because once you use beta blockers, bronchial resistance is increases. So, it <laughs> should be contraindicated, it is contraindicated in bronchial asthma patient because it will worsen the condition of severe headache and it will precipitate bronchoconstrictor. So, it should be avoided in respiratory tract infection, bronchial asthma and other condition. Now, what you get an effect as a metabolic effect because earlier it was to be preferred, but because of metabolic effect now it is not preferred as an anti hypertensive. I will discuss about that because once you start with beta blockers, it inhibits the glycogenolysis. Because why it is glycogenolysis? Because of the release of adrenaline during the hypoglycemia. 
So, in response to hypoglycemia, adrenaline get released and it will accelerate glycogenolysis and also it marks the sympathetic manifestation of hypoglycemia. So, beta 1 receptors can attenuate the release of free fatty acid from adipose tissue because it is also enhanced the lipolysis. Now, another effect on lipid profile, if you see that once you start beta blockers, there is increased level of increased level of LDL and there is decreased level of HDL. So, this is one of this important point that you should go for a lipid profile once you start with beta blockers and see that how it is going to affect. The ratio is altered in case of you know when you start with beta blocker. Now, effect on eye because it will be separately taking the lectures that drug therapy in glaucoma, but beta blockers are helpful because it causes decrease formation of aqueous humor. So, it can be used in glaucoma and this action is sustainable. <coughs> now, look at the pharmacokinetic action. Now, as I say selective beta blockers, non-selective beta blocker, we also describe first generation, second generation and third generation. Now, when you look at the pharmacokinetic action like very older beta blockers, propanolol, nodolol, pindolol, trimolol. Now, if you give orally, it is rapid absorption and it is complete absorption, but in case of a nodolol, it is not complete absorption, but rest trimolol and pindolol is a contract of absorption and it is metabolized by propanolol by cytochrome 2D6. Nodolol is not metabolized, but however, pindolol is hepatic metabolism is 50 percent and similarly, timolol is also metabolized by cytochrome P D2, cytochrome 2D6, it is metabolized by cytochrome 2D6. Now, when you look at the excretion, 99 percent is excreted in urine, propanolol and nodolol is <laughs> excreted unchanged and pindolol it is excreted unchanged, but in timolol urine 15 to 20 percent is unchanged. So, when you look at the half life, propanolol half life is 3 to 5 hours, but nodolol has a very long half life 20 to 24 hours and pindolol has 2 to 3 hours, 3 to 4 hours and timolol has 4 hours half life. So, when you look at the bioavailability after following oral administration, it is 25 percent, nodolol has 35 percent and pindolol has moderately high and timolol has only 50 percent. So, <coughs> look at the plasma protein binding, it is very, very high in case of propanolol. Nodolol is 30 percent, pindolol is 40 percent and 60 percent. So, overall if you see that oh, pharmacokinetic profile, you can have a comparative evaluation of propanolol, nodolol, pindolol and timolol when you give it orally. Similarly, when you look at intrinsic, you know, sympathomimetic action like effect on membrane stabilizing activity or intrinsic agonist activity or lipid solubility because it is very important that how many of the beta blockers it can penetrate in CNS looking at the lipid solubility. So, you can have a comparative evaluation of propanolol, nodolol, pindolol and timolol and specially <coughs> lipid solubility is low and moderate in case of a timolol. Now, look at the other parameters with some other beta blockers like metoprolol which is very commonly used. Similarly, ethanolol is very commonly used because these are selective beta blockers. Esmolol is for hypertensive crisis or acetabulol. So, when you give <coughs> orally, it is rapidly and complete absorption and ethanolol also rapidly complete absorption. Esmolol is given in IV. So, you get it bioavailability is 100 percent and acetabulol is 40 percent. So, it is also metabolized by metoprolol by cytochrome 2D6. Similarly, Ethanolol hepatic metabolism is limited and esmolol is hydrolyzed rapidly by esterase in RBC, red blood cells. So, in acetabulol, it is also hepatic significant trespass by diacetylol <laughs> <coughs> metabolism and most action. So, the excretion is in a urine for metoprolol almost 95 percent. Ethanolol is also excreted in stool, urine and it is unchanged and esmolol is in a urine by 73 to 88 percent or acetabulol in faces and urine. Now, if you look at the bioavailability, metoprolol has 40 percent bioavailability, but esmolol since it is given IB, it is 100 percent bioavailability, acetabulol is 40 percent bioavailability. So, protein binding is you know 10 to 12 percent in case of metoprolol, ethanolol is 6 to 16, 
asmalol has high protein binding 55 percent or acetabulol has 26 percent protein binding. Now look at that membrane stabilizing activity and intrinsic action or lipid solubility. So if you look at <coughs> metropolol, it has membrane stabilizing activity. So that is the reason it is mostly used in cardiac condition and ethanolol also is various uh, commonly used asmolol and you know acetabulol. Now look at some other anti uh, beta blockers like dual inhibitors like labetalol or vasodilatory beta blocker like carbidolol or nebibolol. Now this is also when it is given labetalol, it has a complete absorption and it is passed through extensive phosphorus metabolism. So it is excreted in urine and feces and half life is 6 to 8 orally IV 5.5 bars. Similarly cardibolol also it is metabolized by cytochrome P226 and 2C9 and primarily in stool and urine is 2 percent and half life is 7 to 10 percent and for nebidolol also it is rapidly absorbed. Of course, it is extensively phosphorus metabolism, it is metabolized by cytochrome 2D6. So, when you look at the bioavailability, labetalol has 25 percent bioavailability, carbidolol has 25 to 35 percent and compared to these two drugs, <coughs> nebibolol has less than 12 percent bioavailability. Protein binding is high in labetalol, carbidolol is 98 percent very very high and nebidolol is 98 percent is similar to carbidolol. Now when you look at this membrane stabilizing activity or intrinsic agonist activity or lipid solubility. So you can have a comparative one in case of labetalol as you know that it is a dual inhibitors. It has membrane stabilizing activity as well as, as, well as intrinsic agonist activity and lipid solubility is low compared to carbidolol and nebidolol also, also it is low. Now look at advantage of cardioselectivity because I said there are beta blockers we use for cardioselective means cardiac origin and non-cardiac. Now when you select a cardioselective beta blockers like it only act on beta 1 receptors. So it can be used in case of problem with asthmatic patient. As you can see that there is some metabolic effect. So it can be used safer in diabetes or in case of peripheral vascular disease because you do not have an option that less deleterious effect on lipid profile. As you say that it decrease LDL and also decrease HDL. So it can be used, a beta selective blocker can be used in case of asthmatic patient, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease or patient having very high lipid profile and also people who do not do you know regular exercise. So it can be used a beta 1 selective blockers. <coughs> now if we divide use of beta blocker into cardiovasculars and non-cardiovascular. We have already described the cardiovascular uses. Like you can see the cardiovascular use, one of these use is hypertension. But earlier it was very much used beta blockers, but it was initially recommended as fast line therapy. But now only benefit is Abarsodos because when you start using beta blockers, there is problem with sexual dysfunction and those beta blocker has a high lipid solubility. It and also causes sleep disturbances, depression, fatigue because of metabolic action or and so you can see metabolic disturb disturbances. So it is not been preferred as first line therapy. So if you have the problem like we discussed that in case of asthmatic diabetes or peripheral vascular disease definitely you are going to use selective one. Now second thing is why it consider beta blocker it consider to use suppose if you have any intolerance or contraindication to AC inhibitors or angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. Then one can think about beta 1 blockers otherwise if you have a patient with hypertension which have a MI, ischemic heart disease or congestive heart failure. Now in case of a young patient with sign of increased sympathetic drive definitely you are going to prefer beta 1 blockers and in case of a woman with childbearing potential because other drugs which is mentioned is AC inhibitor and 
angiotensin 2 are teratogenic. So, you are going to select beta 1 blocker for child bearing potential. So, this is what that you are going to prefer though earlier it was potential to be first line therapy, but nowadays it is only preferred if you have intolerance or contraindication to AC inhibitor or hypertension with MI, <coughs> ischemic heart disease or congestive heart disease, younger patient with high sympathetic drive. So, definitely you are going to prefer or child bearing age. Now, what are the options we have? As I said, it is most commonly used is etanolol. It is most commonly used, it is beta 1 selective because it is very hydrophilic and it has poor lipid solubility, so limited CNS penetration. So, whatever you know CNS area we have found, it is less compared to other beta blockers. Second commonly used beta blocker use is metoprolol. It is also beta 1 selective and advantage with metoprolol as I said that beta blocker when you start using it, it alter the metabolic you know potential. So, it can be used in diabetes as well as hypertension or in congestive heart failure. So, these are advantage with etanolol and metoprolol. Now, what happened in emergency? Of course, beta blocker is not preferred, but if you have a patient with systolic systolic hypertension 180 and diastolic is 120. So, we have a option that we give sodium natroposide or irreversible alpha 1 blockers like phenoxybenzamine. But at the same time, we have also option of nitroglycerin or preferred beta blockers are esmolol. Preferably, initial is 80 to 500 microgram per kg over a minute, then it is increased to 50 to 300 microgram, it is a maintenance dose basically with esmolol, but you can also give labetalol. In case of hypertensive emergency, labetalol is a dual inhibitor, we start with 2 milligram per minute up to 300 milligram and 20 milligram over 2 minutes, then we give 40 to 80 milligram 10 minute interval up to 300 milligram total. So, though we do not prefer beta blockers, but like condition like pure homocytoma. But still, we have an option of esmolol and labetalol for hypertensive emergency. Now, look at labetalol. <coughs> it is basically a dual inhibitor of third generation. Now, why it is dual inhibitor? Because it block alpha 1 receptors as well as beta 1 and beta 2. It has a partial agonistic effect. So, it inhibit the neural uptake of, so it has a sympathetic central axon also. It inhibit the norepinephrine release like cocaine like effect. So, it is preferred as I discussed that it preferred in hypertensive emergency, condition like pheochromocytoma or pregnancy induced hypertension. So, this dual inhibitor is preferred in three conditions. One is hypertensive emergency, then pheochromocytoma, then PIH, pregnancy induced hypertension. Look at earlier when you used to read the textbook used to say that beta blocker is contraindicated in bronchial asthma, still it is contraindicated. It is also contraindicated in congestive heart failure, but now we have a vasodilatory beta blockers which are commonly used in case of congestive heart failure. Now, how it is act? Now, as you know that in heart failure, there is a decreased cardiac output, there is an increased sympathetic activation and it also activates beta 1 receptor. So, when you give beta 1 blockers, as you say that it has a stimulatory action. So, you can block the stimulatory action of myocardium. So, it will inhibit the myocardial hypertrophy and also whatever the process of remodeling, it will inhibit. Now, at the same time, these beta blockers are also present in kidney as we discussed earlier. So, definitely it will inhibit the renin release. So, it has been preferred. Now, what are the drug it is preferred? Most commonly used drug, you can say carbidolol, bisondolol metoprolol, these are also called vasodilatory beta blockers. Now, you can start with initial dose 3.125 milligram twice a day and this dose can increase up to 25 to 50 milligram. Similarly, bisondolol also 1.25 milligram four times a day, it can increase up to 10 milligram four times a day and metoprolol also 12.5 to 200 milligram. So, these are the drugs specially cardio, carbidolol is most commonly used including bisondolol and metoprolol. Now, look at <laughs> carbidolol. As I say, it has axon on alpha 1 receptors 
<coughs> beta 1 receptors and it will also have a beta 2 blockers. Now, along with that, literature also suggests that it has antioxidant properties. That is the reason it has been preferred. Now, it also inhibit free radical induced lipid peroxidation and also affect on peripheral vascular smooth muscle mitogenesis. So, that is the reason it has been preferred in case of congestive heart failure or in case of a hypertension because it acts as a cardioprotective action, carbidolol. Now, what happened in angina pectoris? Like pain in a cyst, we preferably use beta blockers because you want a drug so that heart can use the oxygen, smaller oxygen, small amount of oxygen it can survive. So, you try to decrease the cardiac workload. Second is decrease the myocardial oxygen demand. So, that is the reason we prefer beta blockers. Now, if you see, we also use combined with nitrate for chronic prophylaxis. And we have a cardio selective beta blockers like we have ethanolol and metropolol. And abrupt withdrawal, it might also precipitate MI. Because if you suddenly stop beta blockers, there is a up regulation of beta receptor also. So, one has to be very careful. And these two drugs <laughs> is contraindicated in priest metal angina. So, one has to be very careful that abruptly it should not be stopped because it causes up regulation of beta receptors. Now, let us discuss about myocardial infarction. As you see that it has a therapeutic potential in angina pectoris. Now, what happened in myocardial infarction? Now, you can see that myocardial salvage during evaluation of MI, we use beta blockers because we wanted that there should be limited infarct size by reducing the oxygen consumption and we also want that there should be further prevention of reinfraction. So, when there is infarction take place, there is chances of reinfraction also. At the same time, it also initiate the action of arrhythmia like ventricular fibrillation. So, by using beta blockers, we prevent arrhythmia like ventricular fibrillation. So, but however, it is not given if the heart rate is less than 60 per minute or if there is systolic blood pressure is less than 90 mm per mercury or PR interval is more than 0.24 because it can cause left ventricular failure. So, within 4 to 6 hours, we start propanolol 5 milligram IV every 5 minutes. So, it is given in 3 dose, then it is increased to 25 to 50 milligram orally every 6 hours. So, that is the treatment it is given because in MI, we want that this drug should act and there should not be any reinfraction. We want to prevent the arrhythmia also, that is the reason, but there is certain condition where it should not be used. Now, in case of secondary prophylaxis of MI, because there is a decreased subsequent mortality by 20 percent and we also want there should be prevention of reinfraction. So, by preventing the ventricular fibrillation or second attack of MI, usually the prescription is given is ethanolol and carbidolol and it is continued till 2 years. So, usually it is continued following rapid follow up. So, it is continued till 2 years. Now, what happened in arrhythmia? <coughs> in case of arrhythmia, the beta blockers preferred is esmolol. So, in case of arrhythmia, we can start with loading dose 0.5 milligram per kg, 1 minute intravenously. Then you can give a maintenance dose of 0.05 to 3 milligram per kg per minute. Over a period of 4 minutes, it is given IV. And basically, this esmolol act as a class 2 antiarrhythmic. So, what happened in when you give esmolol, it is also preferred in case of paroxysmal supraventricular tacular, you call it PSVT. Or in case of episodic atrial fibrillation or flutter, or in case of excessive release of adrenaline initiative, you know, arrhythmia like condition like few comocytoma or arrhythmia due to anesthesia or in case of intraoperative postoperative hypertension. So, this drug is preferred as molol beta blockers. So, there are several conditions we prefer this drug, but basically we this drug is used as class 2 antiarrhythmic. Similarly, one of the common drug is used is cetolol, sotolol. So, it is used 
the dose 80 to 120 milligram 12 power days because it has additional properties like it act on potassium channel blocking property. So, it act as a class 3 antiarrhythmic. Now, as I said that most commonly used drug we use is propanolol. Start from anxiety to any cardiac origin we use propanolol. So, it is given in case of propanolol loading doses 1 to 3 milligram administered. So, it is a faster action 1 milligram per enemy. So, it is doses repeated after 2 minutes IV and maintenance dose is given is 10 to 30 milligram 6 to 8 hours with immediate release. So, there are two options one is Sotalol and Propanolol, specially Sotalol act as a class T antiarrhythmic drug. <coughs> now, when you think of other use like we have divided into cardiac use and non-cardiac use. Other use of cardiac like we can use in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or dissecting erotic aneurysm or in case of mitral valve polus, prolapse. So, there is a scope for beta blockers. Now, look at the non cardiovascular use. There are several conditions we use beta blockers which is not because of cardiac origin. One is hyperthyroidism. Now, why hyperthyroidism? Because thyroxine is released it acts on beta 1 receptors. So, you have a typical symptom patient will tell you one is anxiety, palpitation, tachycardia. So, particularly drug use is propanolol because propanolol rapidly controls the sympathetic symptom. Typically, when patient complain of palpitation, nervousness, tremor or these are it is or sweating these are com, uh, typically controlled by propanolol because it inhibit T4 to T3. So, it is also useful in case of thyroid storm. So, one of this very common use of you know beta blocker is thyroid storm. Another one is glaucoma. Of course, we will be discussing detail about glaucoma, but it is also useful because when you keep beta blocker <laughs> topically, it has advantage because it causes decreased formation of aqueous humor. But one of the advantage if you see with beta blockers, when you keep topically, it is absorbed it goes to the you know inside there is no change of pupillar size, but no myopia is occurred, no headache is occurred and over a period of time there is no fluctuation of intraocular pressure. But typically if you see there is a diurnal variation of intraocular pressure, but with beta blockers it does not affect and it is helpful in glaucoma treatment of glaucoma. So, one of the drug is we use is timolol. It is basically a non-selective drug. And how you get the effect because axon is smooth and it is well sustained. So, when you give topically in a eye preparation, it decreases intraocular you know pressure and you get an effect and this effect is sustained till 2 to 3 weeks. So, it has an effect of longer action and after discontinue the treatment also. So, dose usually selective is 0.25 drop twice a day, but however, it has a side effect because it is irritant. So, any drug which is irritant to vessels you find it is redness and patient will tell you there is a foreign body type sensation or it can have a allergy or blepharo conjunctivitis or there is corneal hypoesthesia also because it has anesthetic action, but if it is absorbed systematically also it can also precipitate bronchospasm. So, one has to be careful when you give topically, though it is given twice a day and since it has a sustained effect till 2 weeks, one has to be careful. So, telephonically it can be follow up. Now, one more drug <coughs> it is used as betaxolol. It is a selective beta 1 selective blockers, but it has systematic like it less have systematic side effect. So, it is used to have a protective effect on, effect on retinal neuron because typically butoxylol act on reducing the sodium calcium influx. So, dose is used is 0.5 one drop twice a day. Now, another non-cardiac use is most commonly used we have already discussed is pheochromocytoma. Though pheochromocytoma is very, very high blood pressure as you see that we have used a drug like esmolol along with phenoxybenzamine or drug acting on nitric oxide. So, this is 
the adrenal tumors which release excessive amount of catecholamine. So, preferably you use alpha 1 blockers which is irreversible, but we also use beta blockers like esmolol and in order to reduce the blood pressure. Most commonly used another use is migraine. Typically we use propanolol because it is most effective drug in chronic prophylaxis of migraine. It also helps study shows that it reduce frequency or severity of attack. Almost 70 percent of the patient they get benefit with propanolol and effect is seen within 4 weeks time. So, those you use like anti-anxiety dose it can be start with 40 milligram to 160 milligram increase up to 160 milligram twice a day. Now, one of the common use in day to day life in case of anxiety or in order to reduce the tremor. So, propanolol is used as an anti-anxiety when you go for a lectures or if you are delivering a lecture in front of public you have a tension or anxiety with tremor may be hand tremor or leg tremor. So, one can have the propanolol so that you can confidently you know present. So, this is one of the use, but it also block the peripheral manifestation of anxiety like some people have a severe anxiety can have palpitation and tremor. So, it can be used in case of anxiety. Now, what are the other use? One is abuse of alcohol. So, typically person who has stopped taking alcohol they have all the palpitation, tremor, everything is there. So, beta blocker is used or it can be used in akathenesia or in case of primary prevention of esophageal bleeding or portal hypertension. So, in case of cirrhotic patient, this is also one of the use that propanolol and nodolol it is used because if there is a portal hypertension, so propanolol particularly it reduce the portal hypertension. So, chances of bleeding will decrease. So, normally pressure is 40 to 80. So, if you give propanolol, it will reduce, reduce, so we can improve the patient with giving the beta blocker. We have already discussed that looking at the pharmacological action, these beta blockers should not be given in case of any of the respiratory trouble like bronchial asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, pre-metal angina or in case of bradycardia or heart block should not be people. Now, in case of acute decompensated heart failure like left ventricular failure or peripheral vascular disease like Burgess disease, it is contraindicated. So, one has to be remember that though we say some beta blocker it is used in chronic heart failure, these are vasodilatory beta blockers like carbidolol, bisondolol. So, these are vasodilatory beta blocker it is used, but other beta blockers are contraindicated in asthma, COPD. So, all this you know condition you can remember prismatal endenna, bradycardia, <laughs> heart block. So, it should be avoided. Now, one more beta blocker if you see adverse effect profile because when you get a patient with hypertension, when you get a patient with MI, <coughs> you are continuing beta blocker for months together. So, you can see the pharmacological action that adverse effect of beta blockers once you start beta blockers there is increased triglyceride, there is increased LDL, there is decreased HDL. So, one has to be carefully monitored lipid profile. So, these are the side effect then when you start with cardio selective beta blockers though it has a little not deleterious effect on little lipid profile, but one has to be careful about lipid profile once you start the treatment. Of course, patient will complain of fatigueness or whatever efficiency they have in day to day life, they will say that they have a tiredness is more or in case of life threatening condition like bronchial asthma, one has to be very, very careful of using beta blockers. Now, looking at the lipid solubility, it has adverse effect like if it is highly lipid soluble, it cross blood band barrier. So, you have a typical side effect or adverse effect is sleep disturbances. People come and tell you that they do not have sleep properly, insomnia, nightmares or some people also may say that they have a depression. So, one another side effect is marked sympathetic hypoglycemic symptoms, delay recovery from hypoglycemia, this is very, very serious, one has to be take care of. Rebound hypertension as I told you that do not stop in between because it causes upregulation of beta receptor. So, there is chances of hypertension. 
In case of chronic therapy, there is half regulation of beta blockers, beta receptors. So, there is a rebound hypertension wants to be very, very careful. Like miscellaneous, maybe you can say labetalol. For example, in case of labetalol, there is chances of postural hypertension. And also, <laughs> beta blocker, it decreases the circulation to liver. So, there could be hepatotoxicity. Now, one of the beta blockers, some countries it is used, like seliprelol. It is typically a beta 1 blocker, but it has a beta 2 agonistic activity. So, some of the country, it is also been approved in case of bronchial asthma, because you can select in case of patient having hypertension with bronchial asthma, because it has a beta 1 blocker and it has a beta 2 agonistic activity. So, it also releases nitric oxide, so it is causes vasodilatation. But it has no deleterious effect on lipid profile like other beta blockers. Like other beta blocker, typically it has increased LDL, increase LDL, decrease HDL. So, this seliprelol do not have that effect. So, it is safe in asthmatic or it can be used in hypertension or asthma or dose it is given is 200 to 400 milligram once a day. Another is nevibolol is highly selective beta 1 blockers. So, it is also causes nitric oxide release. So, it is causes vasodilatation. So, various condition it can be used like hypertension, heart failure or in case of reduced ejection fraction it can be used. So, orally it is given is 5 milligram once a day, maximum dose can be given is 40 milligram once a day, maybe below. <coughs> now, what you do in case of beta blocker overdose, if it is overdose how we are going to manage? This is very important that in emergency if the patient come with overdose of beta blockers that you have to have the glucagon because this is a specific antidote because it has a positive ionotropic effect on a heart also or you can think of depending on severity cardiac pacing because people might have patient might have a bronchospasm. So, we can start with hypertopium, but other antidote like we can have in case of various severe bronchospasm like salbutamol or isoprenaline. So, you may get a patient with beta blocker overdose. So, we have a treatment option is glucagon which is a specific antidote otherwise cardiac specific or you manage the patient with bronchospasm with hypertropium, salbutamol or isoprenaline. Now, altogether if you see that beta blockers, we call it selective one and non-selective one. Selective means selectively act on beta 1 receptor, non-selective is beta 1 plus beta 2 receptor. And also we have various use in beta blockers in cardiac use and also in non-cardiac use. Now, if you think of therapeutically the class of drug, you can summarize that beta blockers like you can typically take an example of heart failure preferred use is carbidolol, hypertension preferred use is atenolol. In case of emergency beta blocker we have esmolol, migraine, anxiety, propanolol, glaucoma, thymolol. So, you can think of selective beta blockers, non-selective, cardiac origin, non-cardiac origin. So, you have several use and you can just note in case of heart failure, hypertension, emergency, migraine. Of course, I have already said in case of beta blocker overdose what you have to do with. Thank you very much.